So I get to introduce our next speaker. She's the national organizer for Healthcare Now, which is a, a national grassroots organization with over 50,000 members fighting for single payer. Uh, I came to know Katie when we were fighting for single payer in DC in 2009, and she's one of the most impassioned and dedicated activists who I know. And she's helped organize single payer activists throughout the country over the last several years. And many of you here actually know her from her work. Um, also, like Margaret and Mark, she was one of the Bacchus Eight who helped bring single payer to the national media attention a couple years ago. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Katie Robbins. Hey, everybody. That's a tough act to follow up, but it's great to be here tonight. Um, I've been, it's been sort of a speaking tour road show that Mark and Margaret and myself have been on. We've been crisscrossing across the West Coast, and so I apologize. You're going to hear all my jokes again tonight. Um, <laughs> and they were so funny. So I have a pretty bad case of pissed myself. Um, that Margaret talked about earlier. You know, this week is very special to me. It's my first wedding anniversary. It was just this past, yeah, on February 2nd. And accidentally, I planned this speaking tour during that. So, um, so I missed it, but we're looking forward to celebrating later. Some of you remember that I um, completely exploited my marriage um, last year, uh, which was essentially for, for health care, to get my to get my partner of 10 years health insurance. He, a few months before we got married, ha um, had a kidney stone and spent a week um, dealing with that. Uh, he was uninsured, so he self-treated, um, didn't go to seek professional medical help. And it was at that time that we realized we needed to do something um, to get him insurance, and marriage was the fastest way to do that for us. So it works out that he's a pretty great guy, but... Um, <laughs> It certainly is telling how our lives are shaped and our choices are made uh, by this very unjust system. Um, so it's further motivation to keep working. We had a lot of trouble getting single pair covered by the media and randomly at our wedding ceremony, very short wedding ceremony at, at uh, New York City Hall, there was a freelance writer for the New York Times looking for a story for the vows section and she approached us asking if we would you know, mind talking to her about what we were doing there that day. And we, sh of course, we shamelessly started pitching healthcare now. The work we were doing, the fact that we were there because he was uninsured and we needed health insurance. And so we got the longest article about single payer in the New York Times, 1,500 words. <laughs> in the very unlikely place, the, the New York Times wedding vows section. So, um, but I tell you this because it's one of the greatest lessons that I learned over this period is that we have to make the issue personal. It affects us all in different ways. Hugh spoke so eloquently about the crisis impacting his personal life. We need to make sure that we're, we're out there with our testimonials and making them visible because that gives other people courage to speak out. Um, we launched, Healthcare Now launched a campaign recently in order to try to motivate people to keep talking about the crisis and how it impacts them. Um, it's very tongue in cheek. We call uh, this campaign, Will You Cry For Me, John Boehner? Uh, and you can still go to willyoucryformejohnboehner.org and sign on to the letter calling for no cuts to our social insurance programs, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Social Security, but instead support single-payer national health care, uh, uh, other common sense solutions to the deficit crisis, such as cutting the military budget. Uh, and taxing uh, rich people. So this is this is where we're at. We think, <laughs> yeah, another round of applause. Um, and we pledge to read every testimonial directly to John Banner delivering a tissue with each story. So I hope you all will participate. Um, but we are, um, you know, I'm going to try to keep my remar remarks pretty, pretty quick. I have a, a short video to show you. Um, our challenge at hand is building a movement strong enough to win. Uh, this important right. And there's a great video that tells us how to do that in under three minutes. So let's just get right to the punch. I think I can just hit play here.
If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. And that's how it's done. Seems pretty simple. I think the lessons in that video are so important. Uh, but I want, I want to talk for just a minute about uh, what Healthcare Now is doing and what, uh, to you know, recap on some of the strengths and opportunities for us here in Washington State. So folks know Healthcare Now, not to be confused with Healthcare for America Now, was founded in 2004 to support HR 676. Our founder and visionary Marilyn Clement pulled together uh, people that she'd worked with over the course of her life in organizing for social justice. So on our board, we have uh, folks like the executive director, uh, Jim Winkler of the United Methodist Church. We have Leo Girard of the US Steel Workers. We have Dr. Quentin Young of Physicians for a National Health Program. Uh, Mark Dudzik of the Labor Campaign, uh, Margaret Flowers, um, and many others. And we support a national network of people working on this issue. We have individual members, we have supporters, and we have affiliated organizations in 40 states. Um, currently, we support membership and supporters of 50,000 folks and growing. And the way we grew is by being out there visibly talking about this issue. Um, in 2005 and 2006, there were events um, known as citizen congressional hearings. People got out into the public, talked about the crisis, talked about the solution of a single payer system and HR 676, garnering endorsements from the community and their elected officials for this bill. Uh, there was, shortly after SICKO came out, um, what we called the SICKO Roadshow uh, that went through a lot of places where the movement needs to be stronger in this country through um, 14 states, including many southern states. Um, and we have continued to see uh, strength and 
energy throughout the country and people who are committed to building for real universal health care and winning this important human right. Um, so I'm encouraged every day uh, when I go to work. Uh, we have a small staff, but we certainly do a lot. Um, and the importance, I think, of health care now is that we have uh, the capacity to bring in people who are, who are medical professionals, but also people who are impacted by the crisis directly. Maybe, they, maybe they've never done a day of activism in their lives, but they know the system is wrong and they want to do something about it. Uh, so they find groups like Healthcare Now and people who have been leading uh, uh, organizations on the ground. We link to Healthcare for All Washington from our website. We encourage people to get involved and we hope that uh, in doing this, that we strengthen the capacity on the ground to continue pushing at all levels for a single-payer system. I was lucky enough to be in uh, Vermont the day that Dr. William Shaw produced uh, or presented his three plans to the Vermont State Legislature. As Mark said, they are seriously considering you know, a version of, of single-payer for the state. Um, and Dr. Shaw, first of all, he said, he had given up on the United States to do anything meaningful around health care. And so for him to be working on this in Vermont and putting in the time he is is, is a symbol of, of the progress he thinks he can make there. Uh, but he emphasized when he started his presentation that within five years, we are going to have to deal with health care reform again as a nation. And this is because the trajectory we are on is completely unsustainable. I happen to really respect uh, Dr. Shao as the architect of the Taiwanese single-payer system, which is working quite effectively. Um, I think he is right. I think this is going to be uh, a national issue again before we maybe think it will be. Uh, it's to our advantage that the health debate rages on. Uh, the fact that it's continued to be presented in the national consciousness, in the public, uh, regardless if the media is taking our specific message, uh, we have opportunities to go out and talk to human beings about what's going on. And so the people who are here tonight have a big responsibility. Um, you know there's a, a bill, uh, both in the state and HR 676 on the national level. Um, we have information about uh, how a single-payer system can solve the crisis. We need to make sure that we're pressuring our elected officials, but you don't just need to call your elected official. You need to call your friends, your family, your coworkers, uh, your communities to activate them to put pressure on. So this is the challenge at hand. Um, you know, I don't want to underscore the challenges that we have, or I don't want to underestimate the challenges that we have, um, there's a tremendous political demand that we support this new law and see if it works. Um, we're anticipating uh, its failure simply because it doesn't meet the values that we apply to a healthcare system that works. It's not universal. It's not going to make sure that people get care when they need it, so it's not equitable. Um, it's not going to contain costs. We are still going to be paying more as a nation and as individuals for a healthcare system that works to keep us out. Uh, in addition to that, the serious threats to our social insurance programs uh, is, going, is creating a dynamic that is very difficult to organize as we defend the gains that we've made, but also offensively we need to be talking about the vision that we support, real universal health care, and we know that uh, it can be the solution to so many of the, of the problems that uh, you know, people claim we have with the deficit um, and otherwise. Um, the opportunity is that uh, we have the solution. We know that uh, the public supports us. We know that physicians and nurses support this. Uh, we know that we are right. And the policy holds up. We can look to other countries that are doing this nationally, and we hope that we can see a state move to this system here. If that happens, the next time we go back to defend back to organize on the national level, when the national window opens again, it changes the dynamics completely. Uh, so we want to support all efforts uh, organizing for this. And a unified movement going forward will help to strengthen us. It will help us to turn our lone nuts uh, into uh, sane leaders. <laughs> So I'm going to just read one more quote, and then I know we have a lot of uh, 
Q&A to get to as well. Um, I've been uh, reading a book about the people who've been, who were involved with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and this is a quote by Angeline Butler that I find very appropriate for our work ahead. Change and revolution are created by individuals who react to a given situation, study it, envision a solution, then step forward and step activity, set activity into motion. So with that, I look forward to the discussion and thank you so much for having me here today.